Before we get into the video, I wanted to share a special tool that David and I have been using for over two years to manage our inventory on Amazon. Uh, the tool is called SoStocked, and it, it is a very powerful tool. Uh, it's designed specifically for inventory management. Uh, if you're in a physical products business at selling on Amazon, you need to be in stock, um, especially with the inventory restrictions lately. This tool is incredibly powerful. Um, if you're having trouble with inventory management, this might be a tool to help you. Uh, so Stock has partnered with Firing Demand, and they've offered our uh, guests, our listeners, a 30-day free trial. So click the link in the video description to get 30-day free trial. On to the video. Welcome, everyone, to the Firing Demand podcast. On today's episode, we have the honor to interview Ramiro Velasco. Ramiro is a Mexican national and veteran Amazon expert. Ramiro believes business is about the people, align incentives to create win-wins. Ramiro once helped grow sales for a brand by 40,000%. Uh, now he is on a mission to give Mexican and Latin America consumers access to the world's best brands. Ramiro is the president and co-founder of Go Advance. Welcome to the show, Ramiro. Thank you so much, David. Just really happy to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we're excited for this podcast. So to start things off, can you please share with our listeners a little bit about your background and your path to becoming a marketer, an Amazon seller, and a business owner? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God. And this is this is a little bit of a little bit of a longer story than probably you're used to. But essentially, I grew up all around the world. Two and a half years old, get sent away, have to do some well, follow my dad to uh, to his job, and we were functionally expats our entire lives, right? Studied in Romania, did a bunch of things. And then I did university in the UK where mistakenly I went into engineering. And I say mistakenly because my I am not an engineer. Like I don't, I was talking about this the other day about how, how, so how did you like get through? How did you get your degree? I'm like, I learned how to answer the questions, but like, you know, I'm not, I'm not wired in that way, you know, excuse me. So I, I finished my engineering school and I'm like, you know what? I want to go back to Mexico. I want to live in Mexico. I miss it. I haven't been around. Like at that point, the last time I had visited was five years ago, right? I'm like, I want to go back and I want to just make a life there. My entire family's against it. They're like, are you kidding me? It's dangerous. Oh my God. It's like the opportunities aren't there. Like all these things. And I'm like, no, like I want to get tacos in the, like on the corner, you know, like that's, that's the life I want. So I come back and I start applying for engineering jobs. Cause that's really all I know at this point. I'm 24, maybe like I have my degree. I worked for a year in Indonesia. And then I was like, as a writer, like nothing. I'm like, what, what can I offer to this world? engineering jobs in Mexico just weren't very well paid. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to apply to any. Close my eyes, made a generic CV, and just shot it out. I think we've all been there. Just shot it out. One of the first interviews I landed was with a marketing agency for Amazon. I show up and the vibe is good and the coffee's great. I This is, I, honestly, the coffee was everything. I was like, yeah, I think I could do this. And when I started doing marketing on Amazon, I was like, wait, this is exactly, this is exactly my vibe. This is exactly what I'm good at. Because it's got problem solving, like maybe engineering school you'd have, but it doesn't have, like, you don't have to know how to do any uh, calculus, right? Like it's, it's, it's sort of like the basics of things. So what you, you, what I found was that it's, it's functionally a mix of problem solving and creativity, which I have this music background. I was doing uh, singer songwriter stuff for years and some of the creative stuff stuck, some of the engineering stuff stuck, some of the Excel stuff stuck. I'm like, oh, this is exactly what I'm, what I want to do. So I worked there for about four years and about a year and a half ago, I was like, all right, I can do my own thing. The hubris of going, I can do my own thing. As a Mexican consumer, by this point, I've been living in Mexico for several years. The Amazon selection isn't great. Like that's that's just to the point where, and we'll talk about the the sort of macro lens aspect of it. But I was like, wait, we can just help brands get into Mexico because this is a niche that no one's doing. And I can help, I can bring value directly, not only to clients, which cool, like bring more value to clients is ultimately what makes a business run. But bring value to consumers make the Mexican market seem more legitimate or like make it more legitimate and give a broader product selection at fairer prices to everyone that's shopping in country. That is direct economic stimulation. That was so exciting to me. that I was like, I'm actually doing a good for my community. And I think that's what's ultimately driving this entire thing and the 12 hour work days and the, you know, sleepless nights and everything that goes into owning a business is, is this feeling of, all right, at least I'm doing something that's moderately useful for a lot of people. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, welcome to Show Ramiro. And you've got a very diverse background, marketing, engineering, and, and you had mentioned singer-songwriter. So it's kind of cool that you've kind of smashed them all together and like figured out what, yeah. what drives you and what motivates you. I really like that. 
So what part of Mexico, you're living in Mexico now? I'm living in Mexico right now, Guadalajara. Guadalajara, okay. Yes. And it's the second biggest city. We've got uh, a big tourism sort of uh, vibe, but not as much as Cancun's or beach places. It's a weird mix. We also have financial districts. We have, it's just a regular, like, big city. Gotcha. No, that's interesting. Uh, before we get into some in-depth questions, are you a football fan? I wish I was. Yeah. I wish I was. All of my cousins are. All of my family is. And they're just upset. I'm like, I don't want to I don't want to be upset when like something I have no control over. Like I love live football. But like yeah. if I'm going to sit down on a Friday night to watch it, probably not, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, no worries. We had a team come from Latin America to so David and I are both from St. Louis. We just got our first soccer team this year. And we played against um, in a tournament against a club from uh, Club America, which is big from Latin America. I think they're one of the best clubs there. They came here, and it was not good for us. I can tell you that much. So, but they are simultaneously the the club with the most fans and the most haters by far. So they are literally known for being the the club that says, "Yeah, hate me more." And their fans will wear the jerseys, knowing that they're going to get booed on the streets because it's like <laughs> the 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 thing for them. So that's awesome. Awesome. So let's. Let's dive right into it. So my first question for you would be, you know, a lot of people listening now on this show, are, they sell primarily um, Amazon. And so why should a third party seller selling on Amazon US consider selling into Mexico? What are some, you know, pros, cons, benefits? Probably the thing I talk about the most recently. It, it, within country, it's become a political debate. It's become a, well, the country actually looks really good. And then people that are opposed to the governor, to the to the governing party right now will say, yeah, but that doesn't matter because it's going to crash. So it's currently like this heated debate has become politicized. I can only look at the numbers. If you say I have a diverse background. I also traded for about two years for a living, which is something I'm not proud of. I don't, I, I, again, like if I'm, if I'm, if I like bringing value to people, maybe when I was trading for two years, I wasn't bringing value to anyone, you know, we look at every macroeconomic sort of measure and it, it looks fantastic. The handling of the pandemic, for example, Mexico didn't print extra money. Mexico didn't go into debt with the IMF, as, as so many countries did. Mexico decided, we, we literally just tightened our belt and went, all right, well, we're, we're going to tough it out, which means we saw a really good recovery post-pandemic. On the other hand, we, see, uh, we saw during the pandemic, every single port on the West Coast completely backed up in the U.S., Right. It was impossible to get products in from China. Sometimes you, the, the, the message would be, yeah, the ship is, or they can't get an appointment for a month and a half. Um, so what happened was a lot of the third-party sellers started looking to Mexico for manufacturing alternatives. So we're seeing this this uh, direct trade relationship grow. Mexico recently, within I think maybe six weeks ago, surpassed China as the U.S.'s number one trading partner. So macroeconomically, we're seeing a like so much, not only direct growth, but setting the seeds for the f next 10 years. Tesla building a gigafactory in Monterrey. We have near shoring companies, Awire, for uh, just because they can't keep up with, with the demand of manufacturers looking, well, sellers looking to manufacture in Mexico. We're, we're seeing, thanks to all of this, a very strong peso, which means that we, we can hit lower price points and still make the same margin in US dollars. And to add on top of that, you have things like uh, remote work that, that has just sent jobs all around Latin America, not just Mexico, which is leading to dollar, dollars flooding into the country and expanding the purchasing power of the middle class. What we're seeing, and then on top of everything, like that's just the macroeconomic aspects of it. On the other hand, you have 700 million people across Latin America, 123 million in Mexico being slowly digitized in their shopping behavior. I mean, I got here seven years ago and seven years ago, 10 years ago, I was doing all my shopping on Amazon when I was in the UK. So seven years ago, I get here and there's still this trust. There's this, wait, when you order, does it actually get to your house? And you go, yes, I've been doing this for years. Like this is what I, this, you know? And it, so that is slowly being eroded away. This distrust payment solutions are being brought into the fray. So uh, Mexico is a cash-based economy for a lot of people don't run credit cards. We don't have the, the debt culture that exists in uh, other countries. So for a lot of time, it's like, okay, but how do I pay? Well, payment solutions were implemented. You can actually, I can order on Amazon and pay at the corner shop. Like, that's crazy. I can go there, pay in cash, and they receive it, and I get my Amazon thing product. The solutions are being taken, or the, or the steps are being taken, the so solutions being devised. On top of the macroeconomic sort of uh, landscape, also digitize all these shoppers. So what we're seeing is a growing pie, and we're seeing the U.S. was maybe eight years ago when you could pull out the 18,000 review garlic crusher, and it was just <laughs> put SEO, you know what I mean? Put SEO, put on your, your image, like really nice gallery image from Fiverr, 
off you go. So it's just this mix, this swirl of things that made us gamble in going, wait, Mexico is going to go crazy for the next 10 years. Mexico is a place to be to have that gold rush. Is it an immediate like, hey, I just put it in. I'm now selling hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, of course not. Like that would be that would be false advertising. But it is, hey, you can come in, see functionally like a 10 to 15 percent bump in total sales because that's the volume that we're going for about 10 to 15 percent of your total U.S. sales with some caveats or sometimes that it actually matches the depending on, oh, we could talk about that later, but, and they grow with the market. We saw 30% growth, 2019 to 2020, 2020 to 2021, and then 140% growth, 21 to 22 in traffic. It's ridiculous. So, and every single time, like I traded for a living, every single time I go, I've thought in the past, oh, this is the peak. It's never been the peak. I thought $17,000 Bitcoin was the highest it would ever go. And then, <laughs> look, you know what I mean? Like, this doesn't seem like it's going to slow down. It sounds like it. I mean, everything you just went over was a lot to digest. So a couple of things I want to I want to I want to dig into is one you had mentioned. So it's about ten to you're saying you're uh, you if 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 a, a U.S. based seller who had been selling in the U.S. for a while if they started selling in Amazon Mexico they should see about ten to fifteen percent of the volume they see in the U.S. Yeah, that's it's to me it sounds like all of this stuff you know you're a student of the macro and economic and and kind of like analyzing all of this it looks like getting into Mexico now would be great because it's kind of like very strong. And it, yeah. and it sounds like, you know, seven years ago, there were there was some distrust nobody in this cash-based economy. So it looks like there's a lot of, you know, runway getting yeah. it now and over the next decade as, you know, the Mexican shoppers transition to digitized and, tr and they trust Amazon more, it'll kind of increase. So I think that's a pretty, pretty strong argument for selling there. I mean, yeah, ultimately it's, uh, I, I, there's a lot of, stuff, there's a lot of sellers that will be like, well, I need the return right now. I will be like, all right, then maybe this program is for you. But if you, if you can invest and be ready to dominate the market from now, so you can dominate the market as it grows. I mean, we've all seen the protein market or any supplement market. We've seen like these hyper competitive markets that you're like, oh, if I had gotten in, if I had gotten in five years ago, like this would have been mine. And now I can't, you know. Yeah. Now I don't have million dollars a month to spend on advertising. Right. <laughs> Look at Mexico. <laughs> one other, one quick follow on, then I'll kick it over to David. Do you know how many uh, fulfillment centers are in Mexico? Like is, is Amazon, are they spending CapEx or are they spending dollars to expand? Yes. Um, we have three primary fulfillment centers in our three biggest cities, Mexico, Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Monterrey. Um, they have fulfilled the entire country. Within city, uh, very often you have same day delivery to surrounding areas. You have next day delivery and only the most remote areas you'll see two day delivery. So for the most part, the country operates under same day delivery. Sorry, next day delivery. Oh, that's cool. awesome. That's awesome. That's be that's better than in the U.S. We're we're pretty standard two day. I would say some days you get it the next day, but I'd say we're pretty standard two day. So when we're looking at market share in Mexico and Latin America, out of these marketplaces, what what has the largest market share, or where where uh, do you feel the most opportunity is? Right now, it's still Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre is an Amazon competitor that started in Argentina because Amazon wasn't here. Again, that's part of why it took so long to, to ramp up. Is uh, it was it was a couple of Argentinian guys went, hey, we should start a marketplace, and they made it uh, Latin America wide. Each country has their own subdomain, like the U.S. would, like, like sorry, like Amazon would, and it still accounts for about forty three percent of all e commerce. Uh, Period. So this inc includes uh, Shopify websites, Amazon, everything. It takes 43% of the pie. It does have more uh, consumer trust also because people have been using it for longer and it operates a little bit differently because who sells it like eBay, who sells it really, who sells it matters for organic ranking as we think it, because we all think about it on Amazon terms. They get shown higher if you have a good reputation. Amazon is catching up quick though. At some point in the past two years, Amazon looked at Mexico. Jeff Bezos looked looked south and went, hey, we we want that. We want that back. We want <laughs> that pie. And they're making a huge push. You know, right now, uh, numbers suggest that under 10% of uh, Mexican shoppers have Prime. Play around that, right? How do you how do you optimize this? But that's sure to change. And that's going to change with time. And you need you need to be keeping up with this to, keep, to sell to the people you're selling to. I'm sure we have a listener who sells on Amazon US. And they're listening to this podcast and they're thinking, 
I want to expand to one other marketplace. Would you recommend Mexico or are there other Latin American countries that you would recommend first? It depends on what, what type of investment you have, right? I'm not one marketplace to expand to. My first stop, and, and I have the time and the brain power and the capital to go through with it. Europe is probably, you get access to what, eight marketplaces in one. I'd go there first. If you're going just like, hey man, I just want something that's going to be easy and going to get me results real quick and uh, requires less of a time investment and everything, 100% Mexico. There's no doubt about it. I would compare it with Brazil. Brazil has more volume. Brazil is impossible to get into. And by impossible, I mean just really hard. Tariff wise, setup wise, whatever. Colombia seems fantastic. Chile seems fantastic, but those are mostly Mercado Libre based. Mexico, you can test with remote fulfillment. You're not going to get great results with remote fulfillment, but you can at least see how that works. And then um, it's, a, it's a no brainer. The remote fulfillment, just to dive into that a little bit, to any of our listeners that are US sellers, there's a program called North American Remote Fulfillment. And it's a way to sell in Canada and Mexico with your US inventory. And it's a good way to dip your toe into the water, but you're right. When we expanded into Canada, we have tremendously better results when we have inventory in Canadian warehouses. Uh, we saw a huge increase there. And I would yep. imagine that you should not judge Mexico based on your North American remote fulfillment results. You need to send inventory there, I think, to properly test that market. What do you think? I shop here and I hate when it says importación. It says like, hey, there's going to take six days to get to you and you have to pay a couple 10, 15 bucks to get it through customs. What happens is with NARF, a bunch of things go wrong. The delivery time is one. The other thing that I think really hurts is when either sellers don't make money or they're putting their prices up. Anyone that's listening to this podcast and that's selling on NARF, go on Seller Central and look at your, uh, go into the Mexico Mexican marketplace within your Seller Central and look at the fees you're paying. And you're going to be like, wait, hold on. That's not what I signed up for. Because NARF will take like three extra dollars on top of your regular FBA to be shipping it down. And a lot of sellers just go, you know, I'm going to just bake that into the price and then they're going to go a little bit higher, you're suddenly priced out of the market. It no longer makes sense. We had a case recently with um, a client that was like, oh, we're actually already drop shipping. I'm like, okay, how much are you paying for a drop ship? They got like $35 per unit. How much does it cost you to ship me a case? Then they went, oh my God, $80. I'm like, yeah. So we're going to pay a dollar per unit instead of $35 per unit. Do you not think we can bake that into the price? So, and it was very easy to, start to now come in next day delivery, you know, go to comparable prices, start taking over the uh, the category. This is, there's too many barriers to entry. I, I already don't trust the market. I already don't know like if I can return it. Cause again, I'm a, I'm a shopper that's new to this. You're also telling me it's going to take six days and I have to pay extra delivery and the price is higher, most of the NARF listings are dead. And yeah. this is why people think that the volume isn't there, right? A couple follow-on questions just to kind of take a step back and look at the entire Latin America like market space. And so you had mentioned Mercado Libre, right? The now, sorry, my Spanish is no bueno, but that one, hopefully I didn't butcher it too too bad. <laughs> I say no bueno all the time. I'm a native <laughs> Spanish speaker. It's so funny. <laughs> I'll be sitting across like the, the table for my partner, my partner, somewhere. like all my partners in this business are American. I go, oof, I just got this email. That's no bueno. I don't know about the now. down. So there's Mercado Libre and Amazon. And then, so those are the two big players in Latin America, correct? Okay. And then in, in terms of countries that are viable, uh, that Amazon is in, in Latin America, which, which countries is Amazon operating in right now? Directly Brazil and Mexico. And if I live, let's say I live in Uruguay, I'm either ordering from Amazon.com and paying those delivery fees or from Amazon Brazil. So the two countries they're in, and, and then you had mentioned uh, Mexico is, is the better option versus Brazil. Yes. Cost benefit wise, uh, you'll see a lot more like Brazil has about 50% more volume. I mean, they're a bigger country. They have about 100% more bureaucracy than, or at least no one's doing what, what we're what we're doing. If I had someone that was already doing it there, then I could go there. It's just a very difficult space to get into. But truth be told, I'm saying that because I know how to do it in Mexico. Perhaps if I didn't know how to do it in Mexico, I'd be doing this. I would be saying the same thing, right? So, so Brazil has a higher volume, but the barrier to entry is harder. It's starting mm -hmm. to get into Brazil. Okay. Now, market share, Mercado Libre versus Amazon for, for Mexico and Brazil. Like, What do you think the, the market share is between those two, who owns what? The latest results are uh, Mercado Libre is about 43% and Amazon about 30. So Amazon will still be, but uh, that's another pro problem with NARF is you, you're not exploring Mercado Libre and a lot of products, for example, pet products, you if you're just typing dog leash, you'll see a lot more volume on Mercado Libre. So even pet product sellers that are on NARF are missing out on the volume. Now, my next question is for US-based sellers, 
what are a couple of the challenges? Obviously, there's a language barrier. Besides that, like wh- how are shoppers in Latin America different from from U.S. sellers, and and you know how can we overcome that? One big difference is what stage of let's say like the familiarity people are at with the digital shopping. A lot of the time, it's very difficult to launch non-generic products on Amazon because your average shopper right now isn't going in and typing like problem solutions. I, I'm not going in and saying, I don't know, a dog hair remover. I don't know that there's a solution. I'm not used to going in and seeing if there's a solution on Amazon. So we actually have to leverage off-platform traffic for some of these products to just get the visibility out because it's very hard to break those markets natively. Also, because we're doing two different marketplaces, we're breaking the same market twice. So it's very rough to just depend on Amazon as a, as a traffic driver. On the other hand, we've seen the Amazon algorithm has changed even within the US. And I think everyone uh, that's an active seller on the US has felt that change where maybe we're moving away from let's hyper pack copy with SEO to try to get ranking. The algorithm has become advanced enough that it's like, listen, you convert, I'll get you the people is sort of the new, the new style that we're working. So working on Amazon has become a lot more creative in the sense that we're going, all right, how are we optimizing for conversion? How are we presenting? Presenting the product in such a way that we're addressing the pain points that our consumers are going to be looking for to get them to convert. And then Amazon will take care of the rest. We'll make like, of course, we still want to SEO, but it's not going to be as robotic. This algorithm change also is coming to Mexico. Like that's something that doesn't have any delay. So what we're seeing is you need to understand the right words and the right problems that your consumers are going to be looking for. If I'm selling shoe cleaners, I have to not only understand why you want to get your shoes cleaned, but explain to the consumer in a very subtle way why this is better than your shoe other shoe cleaning alternatives. What are the added bonuses that we're giving you for you to click that buy out, that checkout button? And that can't happen with just regular, you know, a regular Amazon translation from your Amazon listing. It requires like a lot more strategic strategic thought behind it. And ultimately, um, I mean, I don't, I don't really want to get into this, but that's why we set, our, set ourselves up in the way that we did. Cause it's like, listen, like if, if you're not growing, we're not making any money. Like we have to be aligned on these processes, on these like incentives, because there is the market's here, man. I just got to be incentivized to catch it. You know, I really enjoying this conversation and, and Thank prior so to this much. conversation I, I have not seriously considered Mexico. You've made a very good, a good pitch for it. And so what are the Thank steps? You. Like, how do you do it? Let me, let me go into to first what most people's experiences have been because I know how incredibly frustrating it is. Listen, to this day, I'm frustrated every single day with either a different agency, a different importing partner, a different logistic. There's something that I, I love my country. I love my countrymen. I have nothing but love. We have some attitudes that make business very frustrating. Sometimes we're prone to saying, yeah, sure. And then not following up. We're prone to saying, yeah, that's totally the way. And then that's not the way. Um, I recently went through this when uh, we we expanded our business into supplements. We figured out how to do the entire supplement uh, process, the approvals, the everything that needs to happen. Here's what ended up happening. Every single person along the way was giving us different answers because everyone's trying to sell something. And it makes sense. This is the business world, right? If, I, if, if you're a hammer and I'm asking you what the solution is, you're going to say, hey, like bang on it, right? And then if you're a screwdriver and ask you what the solution is, you're going to say twist it, right? Like it makes... But it was incredibly frustrating. So a lot of the people that are looking to do this in-house are like, all right, I talked to a lawyer. I need this. And then someone else goes, no, that's not what you need. You need this. Fact is, it's all pliable in the sense that they were both probably right. But having this conflicting information, oh my God, it drives you nuts. You want to import into Mexico. You need to have a Mexican business. You need someone that's going to be legally the owner of the product. You can't just have something in here that's no one's, right? So that needs to happen. A lot of people run into this when they're going, they're, when they're trying to ship to Mexican warehouses. Like, oh, you know what? This isn't working. Let me just ship it to Mexico City. And Amazon goes, sure, what's your tax ID? <laughs> You're like, what do you mean what's my tax ID? Like, just take the stuff. They're like, no, no, someone needs to be liable for this product. What's your tax ID? And that's where people run into their first roadblock. Ultimately, Mexican regulations have become strict in that sense, where it's no longer just anyone can sell. It's like, no, okay, you want to have product in the country, you're paying taxes, someone's owning the product, you're being responsible for it, you need a legal representative to be liable for it. And actually, any business you that you make has a legal representative that if you're breaking the law, they're the ones that legally are responsible for it, right? So if you manage to get through all the bureaucracy, then you have to get the importing, right? If you sell a supplement, if you sell food, if you sell 
sell cosmetics, if you sell even pet products, anything that NARF won't let you sell, which uh, by the way is, is a lot of categories, there's ways to get it in. You have to figure out your harmonized, harmonized system codes, the HS codes for, for international. And uh, based on that, find out the regulations, labeling regulations. You have to build a label and they have to slap it on the product because all, if you're selling something, the consumer by law has to be able to know what they're buying, right? So they, they pick it up and they go, oh yeah, this is, this is in Spanish. And once you have that, then you work with an importing partner to get it across uh, the border, get it to Mexico City. We actually, when we were just starting out, this was maybe a year ago, we had an issue where someone shipped down, like one of our first shipments that we, were, that we received. It was received in Mexico City. They didn't receive it at the warehouse because they delivered it after hours and they wouldn't re-deliver. It's like, no, you have to come pick it up in person. I'm like, I'm in a different city. Like I, it, it, it's, you know, like we're talking about taking a whole, well, either that or we're sending it back. So I had to fly to Mexico City for like literally flew out on the 7 a.m. flight, got the boxes, drove them, to, well, took an Uber to the warehouse and then got on the plane back here. Like it was ridiculous. Some of this bureaucracy doesn't, isn't very friendly. Like, honestly, when you hear all of that, are you really going to be carrying it out? Like, that's insane. That's why we have what we have, which is we'll be the legal importers. We'll be the owners of the product. We'll be the, like, marketers. And we'll be every, every step along the way, man. Like, I get it. It's a small market. I get it. It's unproven. I get it. It's a nightmare to get set up. I'll take all of that. Like, it, we're mostly a headache solver. Give me that and we'll ship it in. One final thing, though, also. If you're trying to set up a business in Mexico and you don't speak Spanish, you're going to pay the foreigner tax, which means everyone's going to upcharge you every step along the way. It's it's We're just trying to get around all of that because we realize that we can make it cheap on our end. If we can be cheap and accessible and scalable, we can pass on those savings out to our clients, to the consumers, right? We can pass those savings out to the consumers. They get a better deal. We get more shoppers. It's a win-win. So one follow on to that, and then we'll and then we'll talk about uh, go advance a bit and, mm. and and get and get more into that. So so what are some mistakes? So I'll just do a refresher. And so Romero, you mentioned the listings have to be dialed in, um, obviously in Spanish, and obviously you have to solve you know the cust the shopper's problem, what they're looking for, and why yours is better. The second one you mentioned would be you have to have a registered business in Mexico, and then third one is the bureaucracy and knowing how to import and how to do all those things. And so I like barriers to entry. Barriers to entry are, are good in, in yeah. my mind because lots of people are not going to choose to do that. And so that means that to me, it spells opportunity, right? And yeah. so what are some things that some people that uh, if a seller from Amazon US wants to, they tried to get into Mexico, what, what are some things where they where they stumble? What are the biggest like mistakes that you've seen? So anybody listening that they're experiencing those, we can, we can help them out. And I saw with the worst mistake I've ever seen. I spoke to someone and I hope he doesn't listen to this because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of calling him out. It was so silly. He reached out to us. We never worked with him. He reached out to us asking for help because uh, what he did, Mexico went, what's your what's your uh, tax ID? What's your business? Uh, like, you know, and he said, oh, I'm an individual living in Mexico. Don't worry about it. And put his address as an individual seller from within Mexico and just drop shipped his products. He got hit with a yearly tax bill for more than what his margins were. <laughs> and he's like, hey, man, like, how can I, how can I solve this? And I'm like, you go back in time and you don't lie. It was so bad because Amazon retained it. Amazon was like, well, these are your taxes. So you're not, it just, he just got completely, you know, screwed. And it was because the way, like, there's a fiscal stra strategy to all of this where I, this is how much I sold. This is how much I paid for the product only charge me on the, you know, on the profit. Well, you can't like deduct anything when you don't live in country, when you don't know how to do any of it. The dude just got absolutely destroyed. He's like, this is literally more than I made in the year. I lost money. I'm like, he's like, I already spent the money too. <laughs> oh, that's a tough lesson. Oh, it was bad. No, but most people aren't going to mess up like that. The biggest mistakes would probably be just going gung ho and setting it in anyway. It's going to get stuffed at customs, not accounting for um, tariffs. Very often that'll happen. Chinese products, for example, are subject pretty much across the board to 15% tariffs. And what you see there is you pay tariffs on the way into the U.S. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to repay those tariffs on the way into Mexico. And now you're at 30%. And now no one's happy. Another big mistake is thinking that NARF is the full picture. We recently onboarded a client, like very recently, like where the conversation was all of your competition, literally all of your competition is NARF and they're selling okay. Let's test it out. And we brought them on and they just skyrocketed. It's like, all right, you're like 25, 50 pesos more expensive, like two or $3 more expensive. But hey, like you get it to me next day, like, let's go. Like, yes, you're the person that I'm buying from. 
just thinking that NARF is the full the full picture is is so detrimental. And I think the biggest, and this is stepping away from just Amazon e-commerce, the biggest mistake that everyone ever does is look at margins and go, oh, we make more money if we do it ourselves. Because I think everyone stumbled into that trap. Every single business owner has gone, do I need to hire someone? If I do it myself, I can save that. It's like, no, your money, your time spent much more valuably, right? Doing things that you're really good at. Spending time learning how to, like spending the next six months figuring out how to do this. Are you silly? Like you could have been selling for six months. And also this is, think of all the opportunity because of all the things you didn't, right? It's like ah, I, everyone that's ever worked in an Amazon an agency goes, knows what that's like when the client goes, well, isn't this something I could do myself? I mean, go ahead, right? Like the whole, that's, that's up to you, but I'm telling you, like, you don't have the experience. You haven't been doing this for as long as I have, you know, like you do you, but man, just let, let the experts work. We do it. We do it. We work with agency. Like, Hey, can you get the approvals? Yes. I mean, we take care of it. We take ownership of the process, but we let the experts do it. You know? Absolutely. So I think it's, that's the biggest mistake just across the board. Let's get into Go Advance and what types yeah. of clients you, you guys work with. For some reason, I'm so adverse to talking about my actual business. I just really like everything else. We're working primarily right now with um, anyone that's having issues on the restriction side, cosmetics, supplements, pet supplies, anything that's a little bit more regulated. Look, our biggest success stories are we used to be on NARF and now we sell, you know, 10 times more. I love that. But we're seeing a huge potential for the future to build out full-on supplement markets, full-on, you know, cosmetics markets from brands that trad traditionally, and I think this is where we're really proud of what we're doing. Traditionally, international expansion is something reserved for very big companies. Your average seller has a very difficult... I mean, have you tried to expand into Europe uh, through Amazon? Where's your 17 VAT numbers? And you're like... And so so traditionally, it's, uh, it's, it's opened up. NARF has opened it, or e-commerce in general has opened it, even drop shipping has opened it. But to be natively within a country selling has been just reserved to your Coca-Colas and your, you know, head and shoulders or whatever it is that you used to get at the supermarket. So us, like what we're really proud of is that we're opening this up to medium-sized enterprises. Right? Obviously for most really small enterprises, is it worth it dividing your inventory? Like if you're buying a pallet at a time, you know, like let's let's be clever about this. Before the medium enterprises and even the like the small large enterprises, we're just opening that door, and that's what we're really proud of. You know, of saying these are products that I saw on TikTok, and now I get access to them. These are Shark Tank products that I only saw on the like subtitled version of of Shark Tank US that are, we're now getting into the country. We're really focused on restricted products, products that already have some demand or just interesting solutions. But look, if, if, if you're having trouble expanding, like the way we work is, I'm going a little bit in circles, but the way we work is it has to make sense for you. It has to make sense for us, of course, but like it has to make sense for you. You're, you, everyone that's ever worked on Amazon marketing has had an experience of, I'm not sure I can help you. And that feels awful. I don't, I don't want to go through that again. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to get the, Hey, this isn't working email. So I'm like, look, let me just, I anti sell people. I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me do the market research. Let me see if there's a space for your product. Let's just make sure that like we're setting ourselves up as best as we can for success. And then if it really is a market, then like let's launch. So we, we put in that legwork, you know, come talk to us and then we'll, we'll see if, if it works for you. No, I like that. And, and yeah, it, it's always a, a better business relationship when it's a win-win, you know, when it's a, a win for both sides, it, it just is a better, better outlook. So no, awesome. So yeah, if anybody listening is getting excited about hearing about all, you know, expanding into Mexico, Amazon, well, at the end of the, we'll have in the show notes, links and all that. So excellent. So Ramirez, for all of our guests, we run everybody through the ringer and it's called the fire round. Okay. Are you ready? You know what? I am ready. What is your favorite book? It's such a cop out, but I'm just now reading Dune and it is by far the best book I've read. Like the by far the most invested I've ever been. Oh my God, that book is, that's it. Yeah. Okay. You said <laughs> Dune, like D-U-N-E? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, watched, I watched the movie. I thought it was incredible. It was the best cinema experience I had ever had. And I was like, you know what? I'll wait for the second one. And when the second one got delayed, I started the book. I was like, because it was supposed to come out in November. And they're like, no, it's coming out in March. I'm like, that's it. I can't wait. I'm reading it. Well, what are your hobbies? Music making, for sure. This isn't a podcast studio. This is a music studio. I've got like my guitar right there. I've got my little keyboard here. I've got like music making. I, I spend a lot of time on. I play a lot of chess in my downtime. I It's such a, I'm so bad at it, but it's just so fun. And uh, I'm working out, dropped it for a bit. I'm back on dying right now. My biceps want to kill me. And cooking. I cook like an angel. That I will, that I will show off on. Oh my God. Awesome. That's very adverse. I like it. Um, 
Cool. Tons of hobbies. That's always good. Yeah. What is uh, one thing that you do not miss about working for the man? I am freedom. The idea, like, I got to go to the bank. I'm just going to go to the bank. I'm not going to tell someone, hey, I got to go to the bank. Hey, man, is it cool if I miss this meeting to go to the bank? Bro, I got to go to the bank. I'll just go to the bank. And you know what's the best part? That counts as work because I'm working like 12 hours a day. Like, it's just, it's nice that my whole life, like my work life has expanded into the entire day. So that's productivity. I have to call to cancel my my cable subscription. This is work because I got to, I got to put it sometime, you know? So yeah. That time freedom, I think, is is the best part. I, I agree. All right, last one. What do you think sets apart successful e-commerce entrepreneurs from those who give up, fail, or never get started? A couple of things. Strategy, being strategic with your products and, and with your decisions. And this sounds very broad, but I think a lot of sellers will look at a, at a YouTube tutorial on how to scan with Helium 10. They go, oh, that's a great idea. I'm just going to do this one thing that I thought about and just try it out. I was like, no. There's so much more research that you need to be done doing. On the other hand, there's also risk management. Understand that every single thing that we're ever doing in life, coin flips just with different odds. Just be setting yourself up for the best odds you can, right? So if you're being strategic, don't say, and this was definitely, how often do you see restaurants fail? Because their math was, if we fill up every single day, we'll be rich. And it's like, you didn't account for the fact that people sleep eight hours a day. You know, like flip, like understand that you're flipping coins and try to get the best odds you can. Um, and ultimately, and I, I, I know a lot of people don't like hearing this, luck plays a massive factor. Luck plays a massive factor. So you have to understand the coin flips. You have to prepare yourself to be able to flip five, six, seven times before you're, you, you have to get, hit the, like before you're, you know, tapped out. Uh, it's risk management. Everything in, in life that really is risk, risk management. So I like that one. I, and I like uh, the analogy of coin flips. Your life is a series of coin flips and, and you have to get the better odds and, and buy it with strategy and, and experience and things like that. So that's that's brilliant. Absolutely. Uh, Ramiro, I want to thank you for being a, a guest on the Firing Man podcast. If thank people you. are interested in, in, in getting in touch with you and, and working with Go Advance, what would be the best way? GoAvance.com has my calendar on it. The hubris hubris to be like hey yeah anyone wants to hit me up hit me up oh my god it, it got bad a couple of weeks ago we slowed it down a little bit anyone can the contact us goes to me the uh the schedule of call goes to me i don't feel comfortable yet because i'm i have a lot of this experience then i have been so in the day-to-day -day. i haven't felt comfortable and this is my my failing as a business owner i haven't felt comfortable let letting someone else handle the let's call it quality assurance to make sure making sure that our clients are really happy so i'm taking care of all of that so for the time being and possibly for the next at least three months contact us be it leave a message or be it schedule a call both go to me and i think i am just absolutely the right person to talk to for this awesome awesome well thank you so much for your time today and uh, look, looking forward to staying in touch thank you like honestly thank you so much for having me like i had s such a good time I know that I tend to talk too much, so I apologize if I got anyone really bored. But guys, honestly, this was so nice. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, Ramiro. Thanks for watching this video. If you got some value out of this, would you please hit the like and subscribe button? This is a free way to support the show, and it really helps us build our audience. Mm -hmm.